Move in change to Second Kings chapter six. You know, probably most likely you've read that story one time or the other. Find it pretty interesting. It's a pretty uh, crazy time in that time. I was watching a movie the other night. The city, it wasn't a city then, it was more or less a fort. All these people was on the inside. But they could go out and come back. But here in this story, they was on the inside and they couldn't go out unless they was captured or killed. It's pretty sad, but that's not what the focus of the lesson will be on tonight. Second like Kings 6, 24, 30. Jael Ram was the king of Israel. He reigned over the northern tribes of Samaria for 12 years. That was about 850 years before Christ. He was not a very good king. But we would expect him to be. He was the son of Ahab and Zebra. Jezebel. In fact, when the Bible describes the reign of Jehoram, it says he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. But interesting enough, there's one good deed by Jehoram recorded in Scripture. Just one. There's many times in the Bible that just one good deed was done by someone, and then there's no more mention of them. But a lot of times, just one one good deed can make a, a world of difference. And this will be our lesson tonight. The capital city of Samaria was surrounded by the Syri Syrian army, led by Ben. Heyday. His troops were camped just outside the city walls. They never left. They were always right there. The people were trapped inside, waiting, starving, and dying. When they would send out small squads to get food or water, Ben Hayden and Hades' armies were taken captive or killed. Inside the city, there was great agony, pain, suffering, confusion, and famine. You could hear babies and children crying. These people were slowly starving to death, mostly dying from dehydration. Our text says that the situation was so bad that a donkey's head, sometimes that normally was thrown away to rot, was being sold for a small fortune. Today, the king is walking along the wall, up there where everybody can see him. Probably he did this to inspire and encourage his people. There would be a certain amount of encouragement in the fact that, that the king is out among the people, still dressed in his royal robe of silk jewels. His crown glittered as the morning sun struck it. Here in an attempt to lift the spirits of the people in their suffering, you can almost hear their thoughts. Perhaps all is not lost. Because our king still reigns in his splendor. Today as the king walks, today as the king walks, a woman comes out to him. Help me, Lord. Help me. Now the king supposes she's going to ask for food. 
since everyone is, is starving, Joahim replied, If the Lord Jehovah does not give you food, how can I? Do you think I have the power to gather grain from a bare floor? Or cause wine to flow from a press without grapes? You can almost hear the frustration in his voice as he walks on. But he stops, walks back and seemingly out of sympathy, turns to compassion, and he says, Woman, what is your trouble? What can I do to help? With cracked lips, swollen tongue, hollow eyes, she tells her sad, presumptuous story. She has another woman by the hand. She says, This woman and I enter into a contract, an agreement. It went like this. I would kill my son, and we would eat his flesh. Then we would kill her son and share him. And we did what we agreed to with my son, but now it is her turn, and she has hidden her child. O king, I demand justice. Jehoram is horrified. Is this the end of Israel? Cannibalism? It makes us wonder, doesn't it, if the king was recalling the words of Moses in Leviticus 26, when God said, If you walk in my covenant, I will bless you. Walk among you, and you shall be my people, and I will bless you, and I will be your God. But disregard my law, and I will plague you seven times for your sins. Your soul and your enemies will eat. Your strength will be spent. There will be pestilence in your cities. You will eat and your food will not satisfy you. And you will eat the flesh of your sons and your daughters. I will scatter you among the heathen. We don't really know what Joe, Joe Hogram was thinking. But we do know what he did. In verse 30 it says, The king ran his clothes. He ripped his kingly robe from the neck to his feet. And as he did, as the royal robe fell open, the people gasped. They couldn't believe what they saw. Underneath the royal robe, King Jehoram was dressed in sackcloth. Sackcloth was a rough, abrasive, leftover product of a goat or camel. Black or dark brown, depending on how it was processed. To the Jews, wearing sackcloth symbolized heartbreak, repentance, a broken spirit, humility, Hopefulness, a contract heart, and defeat. This may be the only good deed written about Jehoram in Scripture. But I believe we can take this one incident and learn some important lessons from it tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will Help us to understand. Understand your word. Down to the the least of the least of it, Heavenly Father, if it could be said that way. To the highest point. Of it. We just pray that you will help us. Just help us to be who you want us to be and who you expect us to be. Because Jesus paid the price for all of mankind. Help us. Help us, Heavenly Father, for His sake and for Your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll be, there's just three things I want to share with you tonight.
number one. We learn that we learn things are not always as they appear to be. Sometimes we like to play detectives. We really do. And, we're, and when we're going about gathering all the facts, we exchange our detective suit for a judge robe. Church, if this story teaches us anything, it tells us. We are not equipped to judge others. God told Samuel, I will show you to whom to, to anoint as king of Israel. Because you see, man looks on the outside, but God sees the heart. In that incident, God chose, God's choice for king was David, a teenage shepherd boy. Who would have ever thought? The whole thing seemed crazy. We wonder why. And a thousand years later, we're told why. In Acts 13, 22, David was a man after God's own heart. Jesus puts it as plain as he could in Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Why can't we just accept Jesus' words instead of trying to explain what they mean? Is it so we can keep on judging? Why is it that we are surprised when some unfair, ugly thing happens to us? When we have been guilty of judging others. Jesus goes on to say in verse 2, When you judge, you will be judged with the same judgment you extended towards others. We must be careful, church. The center to our happiness and contentment as God's children. This is the center of our happiness and contentment as God's children. This is the reason people are unhappy and discontent. We have been judging others unfairly, wrongly. Judging others is God's business, not ours. Our primary responsibility is not to judge others with the Word, but to judge self. My job is not to examine you, but myself. Are we willing to do this? I may have told this story before, or shared this story with you before. Remember the story about Worthy Taylor? One spring, one spring before the Civil War, a young boy came to Taylor's farm looking for work. Mr. Taylor knew nothing about the young man except his name was Jim. He gave him a job. Jim spent the summer working hard, feeding, feeding livestock, milking, plowing, cutting wood, doing odd jobs, small chores. Mr. Taylor wouldn't let Jim sleep in the house, but out in the barn. Before the summer was over, Jim had fallen in love with Mr. Taylor's daughter. He came to Worthy and asked for his daughter's hand in marriage. Taylor was, was angry. You're kidding. You have no money, no name, no education, no important, no important skills. No trade, no future. You will never amount to anything. The answer is no. Well, Jim picked his few belongings in a carpet bag and left, broken hearted. Thirty-five years later, Worthy Taylor decided to tear down that old barn and build a bigger and better one. As they, as they took down the loft, where Jim had slept that summer years ago. Taylor noticed that Jim had carved his full name on the beam 
James A. Garfield, who at that time sat in the White House as the President of the United States, the 20th President. I wonder how many such judgments we've made or may be guilty of right now. God forgive us when we judge others. And we ask you, Lord, to not judge us as harshly as we have them. You know, there's always the time, I think, when the preacher's preparing a message and presenting it to a congregation. He's always waiting at the door for their handshake that might disapprove of the message. Maybe tell you, I didn't appreciate how you said that or how you presented that. Or maybe just go out and say, I don't, I believe he was wrong. I'm sure I'm like the rest of the guys. They, we all just do our best trying to use God's word rightly divide it. Letting his spirit guide our thoughts. We must learn number two. We must learn to be sensitive to the needs of others. Because things are not always as they appear to be. We oftentimes don't immediately see the hurt of others. King Jehoram wore the rural, rural robe, <coughs> the crown jewel. But inside, underneath, in heart, he was hurting, broken, defeated, dying the thousand deaths of his people. Outwardly, he wore royalty. Royalty, but his his heart was dressed in sackcloth. It was Paul who wrote, "Bear carry one another's burdens, and in this and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ." What is the law of Christ? I think I know. It was Jesus who said in Matthew 25, 40, As often as you do it to the least of these, you did it unto me. The church, the church, the law of Christ is serving God. By being sensitive to and serving others, by serving Jesus in others, God wants us to be like Jesus. Paul concludes this thought in Galatians 6 by saying, let us do good to all people, especially to those of God's household, the family of believers. All here includes the ones that we like and the ones we don't like. It includes the one who cuts us off in traffic. The woman who was rude to us at the grocery store. The rude banker. The entire nation of people across the ocean that we so deeply mistrust. Being sensitive to and serving to Jesus and others includes the people we have trouble loving. Jesus is our example. Luke tells us in Acts 10, 38, that he went about doing good. Does this sentence describe us? Describe our daily routine? Jesus was sensitive to others, served others. Jesus served the Father by serving others. <coughs> Even dying to save us. Can you see his hand on the leopard? See his hands 
scratched around the face of a prostitute, saying, I forgive you. Go and sin no more. See his tears as he cries with friends in the cemetery. See his arms around the shoulders of an outcast as he goes home with Zacharias. See how he responds to the touch of a woman suffering with the issue for 20 years. Hear him saying, Father, forgive them. They are not what they do. Hear him saying, Today you will be with me in paradise. See him whispering as he says, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered, gathered you together as a hen does her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Question. How much, like Jesus, are we willing to be? Today? Tomorrow? Will we be sensitive to the hurt and needs of others about us? Will we, be, will we strive in some way to serve and save others? Can we hear Jesus saying in Matthew 25, 40, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, And as much as you have done it unto me, One of these, least of these, my brother, You have done it unto me. It's confession time. I've had some friends in the past that took their lives. I didn't see it coming. No one I spoke of knew that they were struggling with something in their life. We had a brother here. You would think that he had it all together. Family, nice job, nice home. but suddenly took his life. I never saw the hurt. Was I not looking? Did I not even care? What telltale signs did I ignore? I don't know. But I've always thought that I failed these friends. Have we asked God to help to help us be sensitive and to have insight into the genuine needs of others? Church, everyone, everyone in this building tonight has a hurt. Everybody has a struggle, a fear, a sin, a weakness. Some in the church are hurting, struggling, on the edge. Will we help? Will we be sensitive to their needs? God help us to keep our eyes open, our ears tuned, hearts sensitive to their pain, their struggle. And number three, Genuine biblical repentance will ultimately reveal itself. You can't hide genuine repentance. It will ultimately, ultimately make itself known. It's true when the human heart is when the human heart is truly dressed in sackcloth. There will be a change of life. Repentance is more than walking church aisles. Repentance is more than an attitude. Repentance is a change in heart that results in a changed life and behavior. Repentance is a change in thinking that results in a change in the way we live, the way we behave, the way we react to life as it comes to us. 
Scripture gives us insight to what biblical repentance looks like. John the Baptist said to, to the people of Israel, bring deeds worthy of repentance. David said, God searched my heart, and I know that I am genuinely sorry for my sins. Zechariah says, I give one half of all I have to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I will be paid for the fault. Paul gives us his thought in 2 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow, not sorrow because we was caught, not because they threatened to take us out of their will, Not because we tried to impress someone, but sorrow because I have disappointed God. That's the sorrow that leads to repentance and a change of life. Church, it's time that we let our children, our spouses, our families, the church, our friends and neighbors, even the world, see our repentance by a changed life. <clears throat> I believe that sometimes our effort in evangelism fails because we never because we are never seen wearing sackcloth, never seen in a state of repentance. Churches, elders, preachers. Bible teachers, deacons, let's drop the disguises. Let our children, friends, and others see the sackcloth. Let them see our broken, contracts heart. Let them see us mourning our sins. Let them hear our confessions of faults. Let them hear our admissions that we are sinners in need of God's mercy and forgiveness. Solomon's found saying, pride, arrogance, pretending we have it all together is offensive to God. It is not a proper example to others. James 5, 15, 16. God asked us to confess our sins to one another. Pray for one another. 1 John 1, 9, He asks us to acknowledge our sin fault, and He promises to forgive us. May God help us to let others see the need, the disguise. Allow them to see our struggle with our sin guilt in meekness, humility, in genuine repentance. <clears throat> 